<clears throat> welcome to WeChat Divorce. Catherine and I are honored to welcome attorney Grace Rustler to our podcast. Hello, Grace. Hello. Grace. In this episode, we're going to discuss the different roles life insurance plays in a divorce. But, let, but first, let me take just a couple minutes to introduce Grace. Grace is an associate at Merrick O'Connell's Family Law and Divorce Group in Boston. She concentrates her practice in the areas of divorce and family litigation, including pursuing and defending the following actions, divorce, custody, child support, modification, contempt, request to permanently remove children out of the Commonwealth, paternity, restraining orders, Department of Children and Family Investigations, and elder divorce. Grace is a busy person. She has experience serving as a third party neutral, including court appointed discovery master and is a certified mediator. While she aims to settle cases amicably and efficiently, including attending voluntary mediation or conciliation, Grace is prepared to litigate the matter in, its, in the best interest of the client. Grace regularly appears before probate and family court judges for motions and trials to litigate on behalf of her clients. She volunteers with the Middlesex Probate and Family Court Lawyer for the Day Program, is an active member and contributor to the Boston Bar Association, and serves as co-chair of the Boston Bar Association Family Newsletter. Look for more of Grace's credentials in the bio attached to this podcast. It's quite impressive. Welcome, Grace. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Holy cow. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, life insurance and divorce, that's a topic rarely discussed, and I'm really excited to have you on today and talk to us about it. So let's, talk, let's start by discussing life insurance and why it's so important not to overlook it in divorce. And then let's end our conversation today and talk about what are some options available if divorce, if, if uh, life insurance is not accessible to people if they're in divorce, if they can't qualify for it? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, so the life insurance with respect to a divorce, you know, a lot of the time it is essentially there or ordered to be in effect in order to make sure that a surviving spouse and any children are financially taken care of um, in the event that the family member who is currently paying child support or an alimony award predeceases the end of their obligation. And so that's probably one of the main reasons why life insurance uh, becomes part of your separation agreement in a divorce. Yeah. So a lot of people have whole life policies or they have term policies and, and they don't understand the difference between the two. Right. And so the whole life policy carries with it. Obviously, there is some kind of a cash benefit um, if the individual that's holding the policy were to die. But the whole life policy also carries with it a cash value that's associated with it. And that's something that we always ask people to put on their financial statements as well, because it is actually a marital asset. Um, the term policies do not, and the term policies end at certain periods of time. And so when you have a term policy, you might have to renew it um, as part of your divorce agreement, or it's something to consider when you are crafting life insurance provisions to make sure that if you know that a term policy is ending in say the next year or two, that part of the language that you have in your separation agreement is to ensure that that coverage continues or that it's renewed for another period of time. So I believe we come across a lot of agreements that say, you know, they're supposed to produce the policy to make sure it's in full force and effect. I doubt a lot of people do that, but are there other provisions or language that could be in agreement that that would help to keep that policy in full force and effect without having to track down those statements? Yeah, um, I think there are a few ways that I usually deal with that in my separation agreements. The first is actually, yes, you can certainly put the, the person that's holding the policy in charge of 
pursuing your, or making sure that you're providing that information to the other parent um, at least once a year. But another good, good way to check in on that is actually to make sure that the other person contacts the provider every year or every quarter and make sure that it is in effect. And so you, as, as it's ironic that you are the person, you know, if you're the person that has the, the policy in your benefit, yes, you know, once a year, you're supposed to go give it to the other side, but there's a good chance that the other side should be the person coming after you to make sure um, you know, I think it's really important for people to follow up on those provisions in their, in their separation agreements. And I agree with you, that doesn't always happen. And what you don't want to happen is for that life insurance policy to not be in existence when it should have been, or in the event that someone untimely passes. So yeah. let, me, let me clarify what you're saying. So if I'm receiving support from my ex-spouse, mm -hmm and I'm the beneficiary on his life insurance policy. Yes. You, are you saying that it's my responsibility or I should take ownership in going to, let's say MetLife to get the proof that I'm still the beneficiary. So will MetLife really give me that proof just as the beneficiary or do I have to be listed as the owner on that policy or do I have to be listed or do I have to bring my divorce decree stating that I'm, I'm entitled to get that information? Right, so um, I, I guess two, two answers to that. You certainly can be the listed owner of the policy and make sure that your ex-spouse is the one paying for the policy. That is one way to ensure that a policy will exist. Um, in terms of getting that proof, generally speaking, no MetLife would not necessarily give you the proof of the policy. But in that situation, um, and in my case, what I normally do is notify the carrier of the, the person that has the policy, give them some kind of letter that says, as you know, per our separation agreement, you are supposed to carry this life insurance policy. Please give me a copy, you know, most recent copy of the policy existence and the beneficiary determination page so that I can confirm and keep it in my records. And if that person doesn't respond to you within you know, a week or two, um, I always recommend to clients that we need to file a complaint for contempt because you don't want that policy to lapse. Um, if it has lapsed, the other person might have to go back to the drawing board to obtain an entirely new policy which does take a while, um, especially in COVID, uh, where the physicals that are associated with that life insurance policy are hard to schedule. Um, there's just a backlog of people, and especially since they weren't doing in-home visits for a period of months. Um, so, you know, I always say you should file the contempt. You can always withdraw it once you are in receipt of proof of that insurance policy and the correct beneficiary designation but it is totally worth it to make sure that you have that on the books um, to make sure that it's there. Can you put language in the agreements to read that if a policy laps that, the, that you have, like I would have the right to sue his estate? Yes, ab absolutely. And um, in those situations, it would be what we call a complaint in equity against the mm -hmm. estate, because technically if the um, other person is deceased, you're not gonna file that complaint under your divorce agreement docket number. It would get a new mm -hmm. docket number with the probate and family court and you would be suing the estate. Um, and as part of that, and I, I always put that language in there, um, that if you fail to have that life insurance policy at the time that you die, and if it was supposed to be intact, that your ex-spouse could come after your estate. The interesting part about that is sometimes there is an estate to be had, and that's when um, the parties will fight or their estate will fight with you about uh, what, is, what is left, you know, and what you should have received. In some cases, there won't be much of an estate left. And that's where people are really left with not much. And again, that's why it's so important to make sure that that life insurance policy is intact, um, you know, the, to do the check-in once a year, because you could be very left with a situation where the estate is maybe only a vehicle and, you know, a few thousand dollars in cash 
depending upon mm-hmm. how the person lived their life, you know? So you just That's never know point. what's going to be left over. Right. Yeah. So are there times when it's just better to pay that policy yourself or have that? It seems like that would just cut to the chase. And I know financial um, wherewithal it would factor into that, but. Yeah, I, I think that sometimes it is better, especially if you know that the other their person, um, you know, you've been married to them, you know what their habits are, if they're not really reliable, um, or if they haven't necessarily spent money wisely during the course of your marriage, you can bet that that person's probably going to continue those same bad habits. Um, And so I, I agree, I think in some instances, if you have the financial capability to take the life insurance policy out on the person, you should. I think that there should still be some consideration for that, for having to do that. Mm -hmm. Um, So one way that I have done it in the past is I, um, we can calculate how much the premiums are on that policy every year for duration of the life insurance term um, or how long the, the policy is supposed to be in place. And we can cut that out of the other person's share of the assets. Mm-hmm. So essentially you have prepaid, they, they have prepaid you for the premium costs for the entire amount of time that the policy is supposed to be in place. And that person has prepaid you from his or her a- assets that are being divided at the divorce. So it's a very clean break. Yeah, so the best way to control the policy is to become the owner because the owner is the one who gets all the notifications and can change anything on the policy. The insured is just the insured. The owner is the um, one who has the control over it. So I always recommend you being the owner of the policy, um, but you also can buy paid up policies. It's just, we always hear a lot of attorneys say, um, you can't make them get a policy if they don't already have a policy in place. So I like he- I like hearing this version of it, um, <laughs> except if there's support, you know, like for um, even with equitable distribution, sometimes it takes a while to get um, um, your assets divided. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't see a lot of policies being put in place if they're not in place. Karen, do you? No, no. And as a matter of fact, when we ask about that, we usually get shut down. Well, you, to your point, you can't force them to purchase a policy. You have to use the coverage already in existence. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, and I think it, um, I, I think to some extent it's true that if you are doing an agreement and it is, it is agreed upon by the parties, you know, I don't think that you can force people um, to, to do that. I think a judge has the authority to Mm -hmm. issue that kind of an order. And if you continue to bring this up at a pretrial conference or at a trial, um, I think that the judge certainly has the ability and in my experience has ordered individuals to either obtain life insurance and or obtain additional life insurance to supplement whatever their employer sponsored policy is or a temporary policy is, especially if we know that temporary might expire in a year or two or three after a Mm -hmm. divorce. All of that information certainly would be presented to the judge at a trial for the judge to be able to order that because it is a form of security. And the the courts are certainly going to care about that security, especially if you have young children. You know, if you have a five-year-old or a six-year-old or seven-year-old, you've got 20 some years, you know, 19 years worth of support Mm -hmm. that you would be paying. And if you die three years or four years after that judgment, that is a whole lot of money that the surviving parent is short, um, that you would have paid, you know, you would have paid that as part of a child support order. Most of that money probably could have also gone to college, you know? And so I think Mm -hmm. the judges are very, especially in light of COVID, where we just don't know what's going to happen to people's health if they do get sick. I think the courts are very aware of the need for the the security blanket, if you will, Mm -hmm. for the life insurance. Right. You know, I also, um, you know, 
a lot of times, and it should be pointed out in insurance policies, you know, if you don't change the beneficiary, they're irrevocable. So mm -hmm. even though your divorce order might state that you're the beneficiary, if your actual policy states that somebody else is the beneficiary, what are the chances of it reverting back to you? Right. And I'll tell you that the answer is a court has to order it. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I've been on all, all three sides of that equation. I have represented the insurance company. Um, and I have to tell you, they, you know, they are a neutral in that most of the time, the insurance companies are able to get out of a case um, by simply being able to agree that whatever the court decides we will implement um, because the insurance company does not want to be involved in this battle. Um, they will do on its surface though, they will do exactly what that beneficiary designation says. Um, so unless it's altered by the court, they're, you're right, they're going to just stick to their guns and say, this is what it said. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, being, if it really does, it takes a court to be able to alter that um, determination. And I've been successful in doing that um, by proving that, you know, someone had this obligation to their first spouse. Um, they clearly, you know, willfully uh, did not put their first spouse on as the designate as the designee. Um, the second spouse received all, you know, 500 some million some, um, right. and to show why that was inappropriate and to show that, you know, there might be still minor children here or the person had an alimony, um, you know, obligation that was still not fulfilled. And that is a contract. And so under contract law, that individual breached their own breach their own contract. And therefore, as a result, the court is able to come in and swipe that money for whatever was due for that ex-spouse at the time of death. But it does take, it takes an equity action. It takes a court action to do that, which can be expensive, you know, and which, is another, which is another reason why in terms of um, avoiding these kind of issues, that's why either, as you said, owning the policy yourself to make sure that it's intact or regularly checking in with your ex-spouse every year to make sure it's intact because on the back end, it's a lot of work to try to get the money back once it's been either distributed or once the person dies. Yeah. Wow. Can you imagine being a spouse and not knowing that that other um, obligation existed? That would be insane. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, and I, I, I think in a sense, and when, when people come to me for, let's say a modification, you know, maybe it's a child support modification, maybe it's a contempt, you know, one of the first things I actually look at in their agreement is whether or not there's an, a life insurance obligation. I just did it yesterday. Um, and I say, before I take the client, before I file anything with this new action, I look at that and I ask them, I see you have a life insurance policy you're, ob you're obligated to have. Do you still have it? Let me see it. I want to see it because every time that you re-enter the court system, you're going to be looked at again for mm -hmm. everything that you're doing under this contract and that life insurance policy, that's going to be raised. No matter what you file, it will be raised. And it's very important to still have it in place. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I'm so glad that you're so upfront with everyone uh, or with your client and you, you set it out there, you know, you set out there for them. So there's no running around. There's no trying to get around it. Um, it just sets out the intention so that if, you know, if they want to try to get around it, they're the ones that are hurting themselves. That's know, right. Uh, right. And I think, yeah. You have an yeah. obligation. You have an obligation. I always say, you know, if people would just know you're getting married, if you get divorced, this is what it is. Just bite the bullet. Right. And move on. Right. Would, right. 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 Yeah. And I, I think um, to that extent, you know, the life insurance provisions, it's usually later in the separation agreement. You know, it's exhibit E, it's D, it's F, it's somewhere in the back. Right. And mm -hmm. it really should be A. Uh, you know, it, it should be right there in the front because it is your protection. It is the backup plan. And so much of what we do is, 
you know, what is the consequence of X, Y, Z? And the consequence of not having this life insurance policy in place is really disastrous for a child, for the, the ex-spouse that's still left kind of holding the bag, trying to either help themselves or raise a child. It just, the impact is, is so great that it really should be top of mind for anybody who is either thinking about going back into litigation or as I said, on a yearly basis, doing that check-in to make sure it exists because um, you're going to need it. You know, it's, exp- it's expensive to live and there's a reason that you negotiated for it in the first place. Yeah. And it's, it's changed the dialogue, changed this from an emotional conversation to a factual one. And it is, why did we acquire this life insurance? You know, even when we um, compile people's financial portraits and we bring up the life insurance, well, we're not keeping that because if anything happens to me, my ex's boyfriend or girlfriend is not getting that money. Or if anything happens to me, my kids are getting enough money that they don't need this money. And it's even when people are married and why they don't buy life insurance. You know, why, if anything happens to me, my kids will have enough insurance. But what they're not doing is really doing the number crunching and realizing that they're buying pennies on the dollars when they're buying life insurance. And they're not realizing the real cost for what your estate's really going to be worth and why you have it in place. And right, that's right. a conversation that needs to be had. Right. right. And if I could just share, um, I, I had a case um, a couple years back um, where I represented, I had represented a woman in her paternity um, suit. And then um, I represented her in a contempt. She had asked um, her ex for proof of the life insurance policy Um, and a few weeks went by, he hadn't responded. Um, and so I told her we need to file contempt just to make sure at the time they had a little daughter who was three, um, and he was supposed to carry a $300,000 life insurance policy. Uh, we ended up taking him to court. He was found in contempt. The judge gave him 30 days to get a new life insurance policy, um, because he had in fact allowed the other one to lapse. And um, we came back to court. He had the life insurance policy, 300,000. Everything was fine. A few months later, he died. He died of cancer. It was very quick. He was young. He was a professional. You never would have known, Um, but it happened. And if it hadn't been for filing that initial contempt and following through and spending the, the, you know, $2,000 in legal fees to make sure that it existed, she would never have had the $300,000 that she received from the life insurance policy, which I can tell you has now grown to almost $500,000 in the last, you know, seven years, 10 years since we've had this action. And her little girl is going to be able to go to college with that money. And that's something you just, you don't always think about at the time, but that's really what this is about is planning ahead for the future so that you're not the only one that's financially responsible and that your ex-spouse in his or her own way continues to support your child or you um, depending upon what you negotiated. Yeah, that's life-changing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So talk about if a person's not insurable. Yeah. And, you know, and and there have been, yeah, there have been cases where people aren't insurable. Um, You know, if you've had certain types of cancer, um, some mental health diagnoses, uh, the insurance companies, you know, shy away from depression, um, history of depression, that kind of thing. I think in, I think, I think in years to come, there won't be as much of an issue with that. um, But for now there is. And so one of the other things that we can bargain for is to be beneficiary of existing assets. So if you have a retirement account that you still remain the beneficiary of the retirement account. If you have a home, um, you could potentially um, be, you know, you could put the the home in trust and be the beneficiary of the trust on the home. Um, You know, those are things that exist already. Uh, You don't have to pay for them per se, but it's an additional safety net. And so, 
sometimes it's easier um, for people to do that. Um, and there's no premium associated with that particularly. So it's also a cheaper option for people that if you use your existing assets, you can figure out what's there um, and, and be able to save those for, for the, uh, the ex-spouse. That's a great idea. And also if you're listening and you have current term renewable and convertible policies, we see them when they come in with our portrait, we look at the dates and some of them are convertible to whole life policies without proving insurability. So even though you're going through a divorce, you might want to call your insurance agent and have that converted now to a permanent policy. Yeah, that's a great idea. I just, I just got the envelope for one of my own, <laughs> actually. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah uh, but yeah, know. it does. It, it happens, you know, and, and it's a good thing. If yeah, you have a, good, a thing. good record with your current insurer, they'll do that for you. You know, right. so you can always, right. always ask too. I think some it's, it's, you know, divorce is hard to talk about sometimes, but it's better for more people, more professional people in your life to know what you're going through. So that if you have that conversation with your insurance broker, they also still might be able to help you. Um, you know, I think that it's time to get creative with your solutions. And that's one thing that I like to pride myself on is just trying to be creative with what we can do for someone. Absolutely. Yeah, that. And three minds are always better than one. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so do you have any other final tips for people as it relates to life insurance um, before we conclude? Um, I guess, like I said, I, my only other tip is if if it seems like you're not getting a response from your ex-spouse, that's usually not a good sign. And you should not be afraid to take quick action to go to court um, to fix it because generally people do cure the issue before you have a hearing. And that's the entire point of filing anything. You know, it's not, it's not to get even, it's not to spend a ton of money, it's to fix a problem and to make sure that everyone is doing what they're supposed to do. And so I guess my, my final tip is don't ever be afraid to make that first step of filing something about life insurance, because if you're looking at, you know, trying to save a $300,000 policy or a $500,000 policy in the long run, if you file a contempt and you spend a grand or two on that issue, it is still completely worth it to make sure that that policy exists. Yeah, totally agree. I agree. Yeah, so all of you out there who've been divorced and you're still receiving some type of um, payments or whatever from your spouse, check your agreement. If there's life insurance obligations, make sure you have yourself protected. That's incredibly valuable. Yep. Well, Grace, thank you so much for being with us today. This concludes this episode on the many roles life insurance plays in um, the divorce process. Thank you for a great conversation. You're very welcome. Thank you very much for, for inviting me on. And I hope that everyone learned a little something this afternoon. Thank you, Grace. I'm sure they did. Thank you.